Okay, last time on Then and Now we talked about Descartes' rationalistic and dualistic interpretation of the mind. For Descartes, thinking was a type of substance that's different to the physicality and extended nature of the world outside of it. They are two completely separate things. But is this right? Is thinking so different to touching, moving, feeling? The neuroscientist Antonio Damasio argues no, and 1994's Descartes' era is an increasingly accepted theory of how brain and body interact, and it's based on studies of people with prefrontal brain damage, specifically here somewhere in the ventromedial prefrontal cortex. People with damage in this area, people like Phineas Gage, a railroad worker who was impaled by a metal bar in 1848 but survived, often have curious symptoms. They have relatively normal cognition, can still act like reasonably normal people, but become antisocial or are unable to make simple personal or social decisions. Gage, for example, according to a doctor, was gross, profane, coarse and vulgar to such a degree that his society was intolerable to decent people. His personality, according to all his friends, had completely changed. Damasio draws on contemporary cases like this to make a radical argument. Thinking rationally requires emotion. He outlines what he calls the somatic marker hypothesis. Somatic here meaning bodily. And in short, he says our rational decisions derive as much from our bodies as from our minds. Okay, let's explain. First, what is reason, logic and rationality? Think about your decision making process, whether it's choosing what to have for dinner or deciding which job to go for. To be rational is to think about the advantages and the disadvantages of each prospective decision, to weigh up the consequences and to think in terms of if then statements. If I do this, then that, or this might lead to that. We make these decisions based on imperfect knowledge. We don't know exactly, we'll have to predict, whether one job will make us happier or better off than another, or which turning to take when we're out driving our car. Damasio argues that feelings play a central role in this process. He writes that feelings point us in the proper direction, take us to the appropriate place in a decision-making space where we may put the instruments of logic to good use, and that emotion, feeling and biological regulation all play a role in human reason. But what is feeling? To understand this, we have to think about our body's relationship with the brain. The brain and the body are integrated, they're connected and constantly communicating through biochemistry and neural circuits. This happens through sensory and motor nerves which carry signals between body and brain, and also by chemicals that are released into the bloodstream, hormones like adrenaline for example. Damasio writes that the central nervous system is neurally connected to almost every nook and cranny of the body by nerves. A photon hits the eye, signals shoot to the brain and back. He writes, the organism, constituted by the brain-body partnership, interacts with the environment as an ensemble. Much of this happens unconsciously, without conscious deliberation, Blinking, breathing, sweating, heartbeat regulation, instinctual reactions to a loud noise, for example. All of this leads to a powerful point. He says, if body and brain interact with each other intensely, the organism they form interacts with its surroundings no less so. Their relations are mediated by the organism's movement and its sensory devices. Bear with me here. 
our brain and our bodies are constantly interacting to regulate the body's functions and to think about what to do next. We have drives and instincts. If we're hungry, for example, our stomach sends signals to the brain which might make you think of eggs. If we see a bear, adrenaline starts waking our bodies up and our minds start thinking about that television program we saw about how to outrun bears. If we're hot, our body starts to sweat and our mind thinks about moving into the shade. All of these somatic, that means bodily, remember, feelings, our heartbeat, our breath, our sweat, adrenaline and other hormones, all contribute to what we're thinking about at any given moment. So what is an emotion? It's a collection of these bodily impulses being felt in the mind. We feel our bodies. Take William James's classic 1884 description of fear. What kind of an emotion of fear would be left if the feelings neither of quickened heartbeats nor of shallow breathing, neither of trembling lips nor of weakened limbs, neither of goose flesh nor of visceral steerings were present? It is quite impossible to think. Can one fancy the state of rage and picture no ebullition of it in the chest, no flushing of the face, no dilation of the nostrils, no clenching of the teeth, no impulse to vigorous action, but in their stead limp muscles, calm breathing and a placid face? So emotion is the feeling of these phenomena in the mind. Damasio writes that feeling is the momentary view of a part of the body landscape. Now, let's go back to those brain damage case studies briefly. Damasio reports that in these patients, emotion and cognition are affected together. Decisions that require the person to think about emotion, how another person feels about something, for example, become impossible. They simply can't do it. And it's always here, that ventromedial prefrontal cortex. He argues that this is the region where emotion and reason intersect. He says, in short, there appears to be a collection of systems in the human brain consistently dedicated to the goal-orientated thinking process we call reasoning and to the response selection we call decision-making. This same collection of systems is also involved in emotion and feeling and is partly dedicated to processing body signals. But how does this happen? Damasio argues that those feelings provide what he calls somatic markers for the mind that aid decision-making. They point us in the right or wrong sometimes direction. Let's explain. Think about what happens when you're making a decision. We're looking for a reason to favour one choice over another. Let's take two examples. Deciding whether to eat and deciding which job offer to take. Deciding the first, whether to eat, can be relatively simple. It's 1pm, my stomach's growling, I have eggs and bread in the cupboard, I'll eat. You have what economists call complete information. You have all the necessary information to make a decision easily. But take a more complex problem, like deciding which job offer to take. There's a lot you don't know. What's the team going to be like? What will the day-to-day -day be? Will it be fulfilling for me? What about the location? What they expect from me and I from them? One job has this benefit, while the other has this disadvantage. We're making a decision based on incomplete knowledge. The rationalist view, what Damasio calls the high reason view, suggests that our mind is like a computer. We're running through all of this complete knowledge about the job, the commute, the career prospects, the people we might be working with, the location, while weighing up the advantages and disadvantages as if it's a ledger. But Damasio writes, you will lose track. 
attention and working memory have a limited capacity. So this is where somatic markers come in. He writes, before you apply any kind of cost-benefit analysis to the premises and before you reason toward the solution of the problem, something quite important happens. When the bad outcome connected with a given response option comes into mind, however fleetingly, you experience an unpleasant gut feeling. Because the feeling is about the body, I give the phenomenon the technical term, somatic state. He goes on. The somatic marker forces attention on the negative outcome to which a given action may lead and functions as an automated alarm signal which says, beware the danger ahead if you choose the option which leads to this outcome. The signal may reject immediately the negative course of action and thus make you choose among other alternatives. Somatic markers, that collection of feelings we get from bodily and mental impulses, will highlight certain options for us to deliberate over while completely eliminating others. There are a kind of screening process then. Damasio writes, somatic markers probably increase the accuracy and efficiency of the decision-making process and their absence reduces them. They can guide personal and social decisions and responses, like who to befriend, how to design a basement so that it doesn't flood, which turn to take off the road. They select what enters into our working memory and our attention, and they can also be conscious or unconscious. Acting at a conscious level, somatic states would mark outcomes of responses as positive or negative, and thus lead to deliberate avoidance or pursuit of a given response option. But they may also operate covertly, that is, outside consciousness. So what are the consequences of this? When you start thinking about this, it has radical implications. First, it means that the mind and the body are inseparable, but it also means that the mind, the body, and the wider environment are inseparable too. He writes, the idea that it's the entire organism, rather than the body alone or the brain alone, that interacts with the environment is often discounted, if it's even considered. Yet when we see, or hear, or touch, or taste, or smell, body proper and brain participate in the interaction with the environment. It also has radical implications for the study of politics and society. How decisions people make, like which candidate to vote for, aren't simply rational and calculative, but based on these somatic markers. To summarise, Damasio says that the main idea here is that when we are faced with the need to select a particular course of action, we make the selection not based on the facts of the situation and the intellectual analysis that favours the most advantageous choice, but also based on the profile and intensity of the affective accompaniment of the intellectual process. Before moving on from Descartes, I'll return to the implications of the somatic marker hypothesis. I'll return too to what this means for Descartes' mind-body duality, but also look at some political consequences. Damasio and Bourdieu, for example, seem to make natural bedfellows. But let me know what you think in the comments below. Where do you think this could be applied, and where do you think it leads? We'll discuss more next time. Hey everyone, I feel very lucky to be able to say that I'm finally at the point where I can commit full time to making these videos. Um, it's a great honour to be able to do that. I absolutely love doing it. I'm going to make two or three videos a month and continue to improve the quality and the research and do a few more experiments and chats and rambles. In between but it is a time-consuming job it's a full-time job and it is just me so unfortunately right now patreon is still the only way that then and now survives so if you get 
any value from these videos whatsoever, then please consider pledging a dollar or two dollars on Patreon. If you pledge five dollars or ten dollars or more even, I will add your name to the credits, I will put scripts and the audio, and at some point the videos out early for Patreons only. So if there's anything you'd like to see there, then please let me know. But if you can't afford that right now, then of course it's enough to just press like, subscribe, share, and remember to click that bell to be notified to new videos. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you next time.